delighted you're here. Let me introduce David Capes. Uh, David has become a dear friend to me, uh, to Mark Lanier, to all of our staff here at the Lanier Library, and um, he has helped us in innumerable ways. I think uh, primarily of, of the ways in which he has helped us connect with the families of some of the scholars whose private collections we've been able to purchase. Alan Siegel's wonderful collection which is really mostly scattered throughout the library, but as you enter the front door, immediately on your right, there are uh, several, uh, maybe 20 or so shelves of his books. Outstanding scholar up in the Northeast, Columbia University. And David has helped us in so many other ways, helping us secure some of our lecturers and just being an advisor and a, and a uh, encourager in lots of ways. David is a former professor for many years at Houston Baptist University and a PhD from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, he is now academic dean at Houston Graduate School of Theology. Would you welcome him as he comes up to introduce our panel, please? Hey, thank you. Thank you, Charles. It is, it is great to be here with you today. We're looking forward to this opportunity to have dialogue with these scholars for a while. Uh, they, they are fortunate because I am not a lawyer. I've never cross-examined anybody. I've never deposed anybody. I have made a few graduate students cry, though, when I turned back their papers. So that happens sometimes. But uh, this is going to be a very soft and wonderful conversation. We go today on a couple of topics that we'll, we'll, we'll discuss in just a moment. Uh, you see, before you, our first discussion is on a fragment known uh, today as the Gospel of Jesus' Wife. And thanks to, to uh, Brent and Charles and others, we've got a very good, and I think Simon, too, provided this image, uh, a very wonderful image. It, by the way, it's not this big in real life. It's much smaller than that. So you'll get a sense. But let me introduce our panelists today as we get started. Let's start off with Dr. Craig Evans. Dr. Evans, if you'll come on and join us and sit right down here. Dr. Evans uh, has just come to Houston, I think just a few months ago, as the dean of the School of Christian Thought at Houston Baptist University. I'd left so that make room for him. He, he should be, I'm just kidding, I didn't do that. He has a BA in History and Philosophy from Claremont McKenna College, an MDiv from Western Seminary, M, MA and a PhD from, in Biblical Studies from Claremont Graduate University in Southern California. Uh, until recently, he was the Paysant Distinguished Professor of New Testament at Acadia Divinity College in Wolfville, Nova Scotia. So we are glad to have him. He spent 35 years in, uh, in Canada, originally from the United States, but spent 35 years there. I probably have more books by Dr. Evans in my library than any other scholar. And so uh, he's prolific, written a lot on the historical Jesus. He's written on archaeology, material culture from the ancient world, as, as well as Dead Sea Scrolls and other things. So would you welcome uh, Dr. Craig Evans? Uh, Let's do Graham Cole. Graham, come on next. We, since you're such an edgy scholar, put, we're going to put you on the edge down there, that edge. <laughs> Theologians are edgy people. Uh, he's the dean of, of uh, Trinity Evangelical uh, Divinity School. This is his first visit to, to the library and to uh, the Stone Chapel. He's professor of biblical and systematic theology. There, when he begins to speak, you realize he's not from these parts. He's uh, from Australia. He and his wife uh, have joined us but uh, now living in Chicago. He uh, has a BA at a MTH from the University of Sydney, a uh, Bachelor of Divinity from the University of London, and a, a, a PhD from the Australian College of Theology, among other degrees as well. He's ordained in the Anglican tradition, and he has taught uh, at, at a variety of schools in Australia, but also in America. Recently, he was down in, in um, Beeson Divinity School at Samford University, but uh, he has gone back more recently. And I think I met you this past year in Pittsburgh. Uh, he's, he's a new dean, I'm a new dean, and so we had a gathering at our accreditation uh, offices up there. But he, he has written well, uh, as well in a number of things, The Doctrine of the Holy Spirit, He Who Gives Life, a book with Crossway, God the Peacemaker, How Atonement Brings Shalom. We're gonna be probably chatting about that today. The God Who Became Human, a Biblical Theology of Incarnation with IVP. 
uh, academic press. Please welcome Dr. Cole with us. David, David Messner, we're going to get David to come on up. David, you, uh, if you would uh, sit right next to Graham there. Uh, David uh, is, is his first time too as well at the Stone Chapel and the library. He is the A.A. Bradford Chair of, 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 in, in the Religion Department at Te Texas Christian University in Fort Worth. He has a B.A. in Theology from the University of Oxford, a B.A. in Religion from Princeton University, an M.Div. from Princeton as well, and a Doctor of Theology from the University of Basel in Switzerland. He was a student of Bo Rica, as was one of my teachers, uh, Dr. Robert Sloan, now president of Houston Baptist University. He's written a number of books and monographs, Paul and the Heritage of Israel, which is one I need to get. I haven't gotten that one yet. Uh, Jesus and the Heritage of Israel. He's on a roll here. Uh, the Lord of the Banquet, and other books as well. Dr. Messner, we welcome you. Thank you for being a part of this. <laughs> Last but not least, Prof Professor uh, Simon Gather Cole. Please join us here at the, at the front table. A reader in New Testament studies, a fellow at Fitzwilliam College, Cambridge University, an elder at his church, Eden Baptist Church in Cambridge. Um, he did his PhD under Jimmy Dunn, fellow many of us know and have known for many years, and uh, he's one of the, 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 the bright and rising uh, New Testament scholars in the world. He's written a lot about Christology, uh, the preexistence of Christ, and a little book that I got a few years ago, probably the first book I read of yours, which, which is on the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and arguing that, Christ, that there is preexistent Christology there in, uh, in those early, early Gospels. He's uh, written this book that we're going to be talking about today, Defending Substitution, an essay on atonement on Paul, and it contributed to an essay, How God Became Jesus, The Real Origins of Belief in Jesus' Divine Nature, and the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Judas. He's written widely. Let's welcome Professor Gathercombe. All right, uh, let's, let's transition. I'm not sure how, how we got these two topics together but on, on atonement. Jim, do you want to tell us how we did that? But the well, second the one. answer is um, the, the, the real question we're addressing today is: Did Jesus' death atone for his wife's sins? I think that's the. That's it. Yeah, that's. <laughs> <laughs> but only for the elect is only for the elect. Was she a member of the elect? Um, I read recently that there are thirty-three thousand Christian denominations. 33,000. Most of those are Protestant, I would think. Um, in fact, I know they all are. There's, a, there's the World Harvest Church of the Redeemer. Amen. Hallelujah. Near my house. I don't know about yours. Little storefront church. All, Christians, though, of all stripes, uh, Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox, all share in a, in a particular conviction that somehow in the incarnation, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, God was in Christ reconciling the world, that God was doing something. What we don't all agree on necessarily is how the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, affect us. And so theologians over the centuries have come up with lots of different theories of atonement. There's the satisfaction theory. There's the Christus, Victu, Christus Victor theory. There's the uh, ransom theory. There's the moral influence theory. There's lots of different theories. And one of those theories is the substitutionary theory. Uh, recently, uh, many evangelical scholars have been sort of arguing strongly that, in fact, that's not really the best, best way to read and to understand. That's not really biblical. You can't really find it in the text. Therefore, we need to abandon the idea of substitutionary atonement. Now, Simon has written a terrific book, and he did as a lecture at Acadia Divinity College uh, two years ago. Uh, it's been longer than about five. About five years ago, called Defending substitution and, and the subtitle what's the subtitle to it I'll get that the subtitle to it is an essay on atonement in Paul so what we thought we would kick out kick around got to kick out but uh, kick around the idea uh, of that and evangelicals are uh, offering other kinds of models of, of, of it as well so let's let's begin with a definition scholars are often let's define our terms what is, and we'll start with Simon here, what is substitutionary atonement? What does that mean? Well, substitution on its own uh, is something very specific. And uh, I, 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 I think I say this somewhere in the book, you know, it's actually a very easy idea because even a, even a football fan can understand what substitution is. Um, I think you have the same thing in American football. It's the same thing in American football. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
uh, uh, it, it, in, in the context of, of Jesus' death, it means that Jesus dies in our place in, in, instead of us. And uh, one of the things that I uh, talk about in the, in the opening section of the book is that for, for many of us, we have a, a general view of Jesus' death, which uh, involves, to use some technical jargon, propitiation, representation, satisfaction, substitution, uh, penal substitution, penalty. Um, and actually, substitution is just one, one corner of that. Uh, so it's something, very, it's something quite narrow, specifically that Jesus uh, died in our place, died in the sense that he received uh, uh, what was due to us instead of us. Mm. So there's another phrase that sometimes the adjective added on to that, penal substitutionary atonement. How does that change that definition or does it change the definition? Uh, it doesn't so much change it as simply add to it in, okay. in the sense that uh, substitution is quite a, is, is a narrow specific term which means Jesus died uh, in our place and if you talk about penal substitution that means something more specific namely that what Jesus bore in our place was the penalty penal and penalty are related terms uh, so Jesus received specifically the punishment uh, in our place uh, and so uh, that's one of the things which I don't really get into uh, in, in this book. I've written on that somewhere else, but uh, in this book I'm, I'm, I'm arguing for the more general uh, um, point of substitutionary death rather than the specific point of penal substitutionary death. Let, let me put a text on the table for, this is Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 3. For I handed on to you, uh, among first things, what also I had received, that the Messiah, Christ, died huper ton hamartion hemon, on behalf of our sins, katatas grafas, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, again, according to the scriptures. So 1 Corinthians is written how long after Jesus' death? Because it seems like, it sounds like, that the death of Jesus is somehow being tied to our sins at that point, on behalf of sins. Yeah, it's written, it's written about 25 years, uh, 1 Corinthians, after, after Jesus' death. So within uh, a, less than a generation. Yeah, and of course here Paul is talking about what he, not only what he preached to the Corinthians, say about five or ten years earlier, but what he himself received even earlier than that. So, so he's is, been preaching this for a while. Yeah, yeah. And is it, I'm glad you mentioned this passage, David, because it's such an important one. It's, what, it's the one which uh, Paul introduces by saying, this is the gospel that you believed, which I preached to you. This is what is of first importance. So I, th I think it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, yeah. it's a, a cornerstone. Understanding this passage is really the cornerstone for understanding what the gospel is and what the New Testament is really all about. David, doesn't the Old Testament say something about every man dies for his own sins? Something like that is Ezekiel 18, I think. No longer are they going to say this, but they're going to say every person is supposed to pay for their own sins. And yet Jesus comes along and dies for the sins of others. Doesn't that seem to contradict? I, I believe it's also in Deuteronomy, is it not? That uh, hmm. each person must die for his or her own sins and not for others' sins. So you have in the uh, Old Testament scriptures uh, the sense that if somebody has violated the law, which means... They have violated God's own will, God's own rightness, and God's own honor. So God's holiness is violated by disobedience. So uh, to talk about a substitute, and that's where I hope we can come in the, in the, in the discussion. Uh, substitute is a very strange idea in the Old Testament for dying for someone else. Uh, and that's why... Genesis 22, the uh, Kedah, Abraham is told to take your beloved son, your only beloved son, and sacrifice him. That's why Genesis 22 becomes for some Jews, but especially Jewish Christians, right? The first believers who were Jews, a very important text that this death of Christ is something that was not expected or looked for even, but is amazing because it does 
take the penalty. Uh, and so therefore, it's a, uh, and Old Testament scholars have spoken of Isaiah 53 in the servant passage, which reminds us of Genesis 22, as an erratic block, right? This does not belong in the <laughs> Jewish scriptures because dying for someone else on behalf of someone else's guilt or sins. That's not what the prophets said, Ezekiel again. Hmm. They said that everyone should be accountable to their own sins. So uh, it, I think it is a remarkable so, notion. So when Paul says Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, it's like what you're, you're saying is he died for our sins against the scriptures in contradiction to what the scriptures said. Well, for, for a lot of Jews, that's exactly the way they understood this, this crazy gospel of Jesus Christ who hung on a cross, crucified. That's the greatest, that's the greatest shaming a person can ever undergo. Anyone who dies on a cross is utterly scum. I mean, let's just be honest and use the words of, of the uh, public. Uh, this is a most disgraced person who has no business ever being worshipped or the leader of a new religious movement. Therefore, uh, to say that Jesus died for our sins on a cross and we have salvation, we have life with God, God looks at us now as not as violators of, his, of God's will, but as people who are in the right with God and have a relationship with God, that's a remarkable, it's a remarkable gospel. So it went against every Jewish expectation. Is that why many Jewish peoples don't, don't accept it? Is that what you're saying? Why that, they don't accept that idea? That along with the incarnation, right? Uh, incarnation, I think... Probably. Yeah. I think most Christians, including myself, don't really fully grasp incarnation. And when we start to think about what it really means that God became one with us and fully with us, experienced everything that we experience, how do we understand that? It's, just, it's, it's overwhelming. Mm. And in the second century, I'm getting off the point here a little bit, mm. but the point is the one who was crucified is the one who ate and drank among us and lived with us and called us to be with him in this new family. So the one who's crucified is also the one who is fully human, as the gospel makes it. It's interesting that Paul says Christ died for our sins according to the, the scriptures. scriptures, right? And he, he, was, he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Graham, what scriptures is he talking about, you think? Well, I think when it comes to the death of Jesus, um, Isaiah 53 comes to mind, and when it comes to his resurrection, Hosea 6 comes to mind, amongst others, that would, could be explored. Mm. Um, I think what we're seeing in our Lord Jesus and in Paul are these wonderful hermeneutics, people who can bring forth a new synthesis of Old Testament texts in a way that doesn't actually undermine their original testimony, but does actually throw a new light on what God is doing. I think we've got to ask the Bonhoeffer question, who did what? And I like what David was saying, the incarnation is critical here mm. because we actually have the creator creature, if you like, the, the theanthropos, the God human is the person who actually is going to die and on our behalf. And we have the Trinity now relating to creation in a new way through the humanity of Christ. Mm. And that actually puts a new frame of reference for a lot of these Old Testament uh, testimonies, it seems to me, in that light. And I say a new frame of reference because uh, we find in, in um, 1 Timothy that it, this is a mystery, uh, God manifest in the flesh. It was something that uh, I don't think you could actually predict from the Old Testament. Uh, God coming to Zion, you could see in the Old Testament. A servant dying on behalf of the people, you could see in the Old Testament. But bringing those together, uh, that is the quantum leap in revelatory material I think we have in our New Testament, uh, mm. which is our gospel, really. And I think uh, I love the way in this book... Um, Simon talks about the importance of the forgiveness of sins. It's so interesting that the early church saw that. Mm. Because if you look at the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the second article of the Creed about our Lord Jesus, is he will come from the right hand of the Father to judge the living and the dead, 
And what is the gospel benefit that's in those creeds? The forgiveness of sins. These early Christians knew how to read the scriptures. Mm, very good. They did. They did. I think that point about seeing... Sorry. Can I... go, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, th that point about seeing things in a new light, in the light of his, what has happened, is, is absolutely key, I think. And, and that's not something we should be afraid of, because I mean, that's what happens in Isaiah 53 itself. There's this guy who was, was um, in, in the history of Israel who was, who was cursed, uh, or who, who suffered terribly, and whom the people of Israel had, had hounded to his death. Uh, but then Isaiah 53 recounts the, the experience of the Israelites later. Later they realized that they thought he was cursed by God, but actually he was dying for their sin. It was for, for, for their sins he was, he was, he was, uh, he was dying. Um, and that's exactly what happens in the case of early Christians like Paul. Uh, Paul regarded Jesus as someone who was cursed, but then comes to a later recognition of who mm. Jesus was. Well, one, one Old, Te Old Testament scholar whom I mentioned in the, uh, in the book, Bernd Janowski in, in Tübingen, calls Isaiah 53 just right. He calls it a drama of delayed recognition. I think that's a great way of, a great sort of way to read Isaiah 53. Craig, and then down to David. When we talk about something like according to the scriptures, we are right to go back to what we call today the Old Testament and ask ourselves what texts are in mind. On the third day, raise us up, Hosea 6.2 very likely is the text in mind because in the Aramaic it is explicit. It is the resurrection being talked about, Isaiah 53 and so forth, the suffering servant. But here's where, this is where I find biblical studies so fascinating, the need for context. In other words, it isn't just according to the scriptures, which text, but according to interpreted scripture. How were these scriptures being talked about in what we call the intertestamental period of time? That's why scholars, one big reason why scholars are so interested in the Dead Sea Scrolls, because the texts are being talked about. Now, Jesus, when, when does he talk about, uh, you know, his death on behalf of, of his disciples, the words of institution, the Last Supper, the connection there is Passover, and here he is talking about a new covenant. And you go to the scrolls, the scrolls are very interested in the covenant, and new is ambiguous. Does it mean renewed, the old covenant at Sinai, or does it mean brand new? That's an interesting point of discussion. His death is on behalf of, well, what does that mean? Did the Jewish people have the idea of a righteous sufferer? They really do. The Maccabean martyrs and others, in some way, their piety, their faithfulness, and their willingness to suffer, even die, benefits Israel. All of that is part of the matrix uh, in the light of which we should interpret these New Testament passages in these key moments. So just remember that. It isn't just jumping back from the first century several hundred years into some Old Testament text, but passing through a period of interpretation that has taken place. So what we do is we bring into the New Testament, yes, the old Hebrew Bible, but also the way it's interpreted in Greek, also the way it's been uh, talked about in uh, other sources, and that helps fill out more fully the discussion and what Jesus, in fact, might have been alluding to and how his disciples would have understood him. David, do you want to add to that? Yeah, and just, just to follow up on both of the last two comments, uh, when the first believers looked back at the events of Jesus and what had just happened, they had to say, now, wait a minute. This one who was crucified is alive and with us. And how can we understand that? And they started reading their scriptures in a, in a kind of a furious way to figure out, was this something that we should have known? But the key comes, I think, in, uh, we have several places in the Gospels, but especially the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, the last chapter, the famous Emmaus Road. Mm -hmm. And Jesus actually chastising the two on the road for our, he calls them foolish folk. That's pretty strong language. Did you not know, and starting from Moses and the prophets, that the Christ must suffer and then be raised? 
And uh, they did, still didn't get it. And not until he broke the bread, which recalls the breaking of his body on the cross, were they suddenly coming to understanding something new. And this is, I think, what I want to emphasize in the last two comments. So they began to have their minds open. And of course, the, the text goes on to say that Jesus, at the end, with the gathered larger group, opened their mind to comprehend the scriptures. They had to read the scriptures in a new way. And Christians should not, as Simon just said, we should not apologize for reading the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, and the Septuagint translation in Greek, which was the church's Old Testament. We should not apologize for reading them in a way in which Jesus now becomes more and more apparent. The anticipation of God using a special anointed person to bring salvation for the whole world through a death that is an atonement, that is a substitution, that is representative of all humanity's sin at the same time as every individual sins, that this is actually now becoming very clear as the Christians begin to reread their scriptures. Look at the opening of Acts. Peter gets up at the Pentecost, opens the scriptures, and he reads them in a way that he could never, ever have understood before. And uh, so uh, I think the key is that Jesus himself gives the, the key uh, elements that are needed for us to understand why it is that his own people, even to this very day, have not been able to uh, agree with us and comprehend that uh, he was indeed their Messiah. So the scriptures, and, and to think of all the Psalms now, the, suffer, the suffering righteous folk that have scorn heaped upon them by people of Israel, you have a whole series of passages. So according to the scriptures now is a large number of, of scriptures. It's not just Hosea and Isaiah 53. We can now see other scriptures that point to the suffering righteous whom God uses now to bring uh, release from sins, forgiveness of sins for all, for all people in all times and all places. Yeah. Pass on down to Graham. Graham? Yes, I'd just like to add, and the seed of this comes from a second century martyr bishop, Irenaeus. Mm. Um, and that is, uh, you can see what's happening in the Old Testament as uh, God's great pedagogical uh, project, uh, preparing a people for the coming. And when you reflect on it, the God of the Old Testament is depicted in so many places, in so many ways, as though he were incarnate. Mm. Eyes, ears, fingers, arms, um, heart, and the like. Uh, when you think about it, an incarnation is a stupendous uh, concept. An atonement is uh, a stupendous concept. God, as it were, so prepared the way with the people and with the scripture that there are the metaphors, similarities, analogies, and concepts such that there is a pool of such that can be drawn on, whether it's by a Paul or a Peter or the writer of the Hebrews, to actually be able, under the inspiration of the Spirit, to actually address the stupendous, stupendous things that have taken place. So keep the mic, mic here, because I, I want, want to start with you at this point. Uh, your essay primarily deals with Paul, right? And Paul has lots of language about salvation, lots of ways of talking about salvation, the benefits. And one of those, I think, is we see is this notion of life in the Spirit. Now, you've written a lot about Spirit, spiritual, Holy Spirit. What does that mean? What does that language mean in Paul? You're not walking according to the flesh, you're walking according to the Spirit. What does life in the Spirit mean for Paul? And how does that connect to atonement? does it? Well, without that atonement, there's a whole sequence of events where one thing presupposes another. Without that death on the cross actually being vindicated, which is what Acts chapter 2 is telling us on the day of Pentecost, without that having taken place, we would not have this Jesus enthroned as Lord and Christ and then pouring out the end time spirit, as in terms of Joel chapter 2, uh, mm. 28 to 32. So 
one thing depends on another. We live this side of that great event. And so as a consequence of the donation of Christ's spirit, the same spirit that animated his humanity now animates our own. Hence, we can be regarded by Paul as his body. And things true of Jesus can now be predicated of us. His was a life in the spirit. Someone who lived by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. This is therefore the life of Christ's body, members of that body. And one way Paul can put that in sharp relief is by contrasting it with the former life, the life in the flesh. And he's got a number of uh, powerful ways to express that. It can be like clothing, and you put off one set of clothing that characterized that other life in the flesh, and this new set of clothing. Um, mm. In some ways, mm. the secret of real estate is the secret of the gospel. The three mm. rules of real estate are location, location, location. <laughs> and I think for Paul, we're either in Adam or in Christ or in Christ's spirit. Very good. David, same question. Uh, one, of the, one bit of Paul's language that we see really significant to him is the idea of redemption. I know you've written some on redemption, the Oxford uh, Dictionary on Theology. How does redemption fit in to this whole Yes, and, and this uh, uh, goes very well with, with uh, Simon, your, your emphasis on substitution uh, as, is really important uh, to understanding the death of, of Jesus. And that is, why, why is all this necessary? Why does God have to sacrifice God's own son? And you think of modern, and it's actually already in the third, fourth century, uh, uh, criticism against Christians that they have this kind of ogre God who would have to let his own uh, offspring, his son, this innocent person, die this despicable death. Uh, isn't God a, an abusive father to, to his son? All this stuff is, we have more recently uh, in coming out in all kinds of charges against Christianity in this last uh, couple generations. Why is all this necessary? Why did God, through God's son, have to die? Why had there, did there have to be the substitute? And I think redemption is really the crucial context for understanding substitution. And that is God's honor, God's holiness, God's presence, God's goodness have been violated over and over and over again through every generation of human beings, right? And redemption explains the fact that this violation of God's will cannot simply be made right by God saying, okay, I'll just forget it. I'm okay, you're okay, let's just all get along. That does nothing and people get worse and worse or they repeat the same, nothing changes. It, God could theoretically maybe do that, but not even according to the scriptures is God that kind of God. So God, uh, the redemption is the payback. You have to pay for something that's violated. When justice is violated, there has to be something restored of that justice. Injustice has to be removed Justice has to come back. When you have your personal goods robbed, somebody breaks into your house and they get away with all kinds of precious things, you feel violated. Something is wrong. This has to be made right. You need your things back. This person has to be punished in a way which it doesn't happen again. So redemption is God's way of making things right according to who God is in God's own being. Injustice has to be made just. How can that happen then? The answer is God has to become the redeemer. God himself has to redeem his fallen creation. God, how does God do that? Through the incarnation. God enters into the human story fully, not as a prophet only or as a great wise person, but as one of us, fully a human being. And yet, becomes obedient as God had intended, becomes the person that God had intended from the beginning of creation, to love God wholly, to obey God fully at every turn. Every temptation is eventually turned aside. 
God's will is done, right? God. Get a little bit closer. Sorry. You're, I'm sorry. You're gesturing with the microphone. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm thinking a little bit as closer. I speak. So, um, uh, so anyway, uh, God's will for humanity is fully carried out in Jesus. He is the perfected human being whom God had created, wanted to create from the very beginning. It takes this perfected human being to give himself wholly for the sins of the rest of humanity. That's the way that God's honor, God's justice, the rightness of the relationship to God's holiness is restored. This so this a, is redemption. Sounds this, a, it sounds a lot like justification, though, doesn't it? Uh, justification is a, that, a, a legal forensic way of saying something very similar, if not the same thing. So what a I'm lawyer talking about, would like that. I'm talking lawyer. about more of an even more biblical concept, if you will, of payback. Something has to be paid for. By payback, I mean redemption, pada in the Hebrew, uh, uh, ga'al and uh, keper. And then we have the related terms in, in the Greek New Testament and, and, and in the Septuagint Greek uh, Old Testament. Justice has to be restored through payment. Mm. That's redemption. Mm. And there's no need for a substitute unless something changes. You can have all kinds of famous noble deaths of people who are heroes and die for their kids or they die for their families, or especially in, in the Latin tradition, mm -hmm. in the Romans, the generals die for their country which means they die for the soldiers, and they save the soldiers because of their death. That's a noble death. But Jesus' death is much more than that. He, he himself is the goel. He is the redeemer, God's own presence to redeem. God reestablishes what is wrong by making it right. And that's the way I understand atonement at its heart, that it has to be something that has been violated to such a level, such a degree that God's glory, God's honor, God's integrity has been violated. And by definition, that has to be made right, or there is no God, or God is not really God. Simon, why have people moved away from this idea of substitutionary atonement? I, uh, David mentioned the whole idea that of cosmic child abuse, I think, that God is, could be, uh, we could charge God with punishing an innocent victim. And that just doesn't seem just itself. Why? Is that one of the reasons? What, what are some of the reasons people are leaving behind substitutionary atonement? I, I, think, I think it's really a, a sort of emotional sense that one person dying in, in another place is immoral somehow. somehow. Um, I mean, I think um, I, I was talking to a, a senior academic in, in Britain uh, who... who about 80 years old, I think, uh, saying, saying, well, even the word substitution, you know, make, make, makes me sort of squirm, mm. uh, person said. Mm. Um, and I think it's partly a sort of mislead, misleading sense of uh, morality, um, really, that God couldn't, that God, God couldn't do this, God wouldn't do this, it's a, le it's, it's a legal fiction, uh, it's not in line with scripture. Uh, it, it offends our moral sensibilities somehow. But I, I, it's just not fair. Yeah, it's not fair. It's not yeah, fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the. It's not fair. And, right. I, th and I think that's, that's, that in a way is the whole point. The miracle right. of the gospel, as, as, as David said, the miracle of the gospel, what's amazing about the gospel is that he died for our sins. Right. Um, that, the, that in a sense, this, this is. Uh, the death of Christ for sins, not according to the scriptures, because what we expect from most of the scriptures, at least, is everyone dies for their own sin. Mm. But there are certain places like Isaiah 53 where you have a subversion of that. Uh, he was bruised for our transgressions. Uh, he bore our iniquities. And so all, one of the things you see all the way through Isaiah 53 is that the he did this for us, he did this for us, he did this for us. Mm. Uh, and that's what we have in, in sort of compressed form in the uh, passage in 1 Corinthians 15, he died for our sins. And that, that, that is the miracle of the gospel, which doesn't necessarily comport with our natural sensibilities. Let me get another text on the table and get Craig to comment on this. This is from uh, Romans chapter 3, 21 and following. 
now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets have borne witness to it, the righteous, righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption. There's that language we just talked about that is in, uh, that is in Christ Jesus. And it goes on to say, whom God had put forward as a hilasterion. Right? That's, a, that's an interesting Greek word. And I looked at several translations. King James says, as a propitiation. The NIV says, as a sacrifice of atonement. The RSN, uh, Revised Standard Version, I mean, says the expiation. So what do you think Paul's on about when he says that God put Jesus out there as a hilasterion? Sacrifice of atonement? Propitiation? Well, I think we have to interpret that against its... Uh cultic or sacrificial or you know old testament understanding so it is it's like a uh, it's a it's a sacrificial payment is what it's alluding to i think that mm. word is is freighted it's freighted language so was god demanding a human sacrifice I, i've i've had i've had people ask me that i've had rabbis ask me that god wait a minute there's no human sacrifice in the bible not supposed to be for Jews, but is God demanding a human sacrifice? Is that what this is about? I don't know if it's a demand. Uh, okay, now, now, you need to understand, I'm not a systematic theologian. Well, we have one of those yeah, on the end. That's yeah, right. that's right. So, however, I botched, <laughs> we'll let him answer. if I botch this up, Graham Cole can straighten it out. So I'm not a systematician. I get into speculative theology. That's my area of specialty when I, when I, when I wander out of New Testament interpretation. I think, I, think, I think the son volunteered. So forget about the abuse idea and all the rest of it. It's, it just says, you know what, this is on me. Let me do it. Let me fix this. It's voluntary. And that's where the love comes in. It's not compulsory and, it's, and there's no grudge behind it. Anybody else want to comment on that real quick? And then we've got to be done. Yeah, really quick. Um, my, 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 oh, wait a minute. We have a guest who has just joined us. Walking down the aisle, Mr. Mark Lanier, the Reverend Dr. Mark Lanier. I have to ask a question. Please do. Please do, my I friend. I snuck in the back a few moments ago. I bring everybody greetings. Uh, Tom Wright and I had breakfast this morning uh, uh, out in L.A. And he says, hello. And he says, you owe him a lecture. Um, so here's, here's my question fresh off of breakfast with Tom Wright. In the talk about redemption and in the talk about atonement and salvation, we've made a lot of discussion as Protestants are wont to do about the payment for our sins. Is it fair to also say, however, more was at stake? And Jesus was also about a redemption, maybe redemption not being the, the word we would choose, certainly a salvation of rescuing us from the powers and principalities of darkness. Mm. Not that they demanded a payment, that would not be right because God owes no debt to anyone and God wouldn't have to pay Satan a debt. But that sin, hamartia, in, 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 in the sense of Romans, that you know, you've got little sins, but big sin, capital S sin, has hold of us and something's got to be done to break the bondage of sin and so jesus is about more than simply substitutionary mm -hmm. atonement he's also about rescue um, is that a fair idea and i know we're out of time so i will also say that simon doesn't know this yet you are here sunday right sunday morning in my class Simon doesn't know this yet, but in my class Sunday morning, I'm going to interview him on some of this stuff. So you come to our class, you'll hear more of it. But uh, uh, he doesn't know that yet, okay? So, so I'll throw that bomb out there and then receive. All right. Absolutely. Thank, I mean, thanks much. May, 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 since we're out of time, I'll just say this quickly. Um, I mean, one of the things I'm aiming to do in this book is not to say substitution is the only way to understand the atonement. Uh, that's why the, 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 the subtitle is An Essay on Atonement in Paul. It's not saying an essay on the atonement or the essay on the atonement in Paul. Mm. Uh, it's really injecting substitution back into the discussion. And uh, I mean, one classic place where you can see, I think, substitution and 
the idea that Mark was just referring to coming very clearly into prominence is in Galatians 1, mm. where, uh, where Paul says that Christ was the one who, who gave himself for our sins, substitution language, a bit like Isaiah 53. Why did Jesus give himself for our sins? In order to deliver us from the present evil age. Mm. These are both things that Paul holds together. Uh, they're, not, uh, they're not simply uh, alternatives. It's not just you pick the one you prefer. Uh, if you're, you know, if you're an apocalyptic sort of person, you, you want Jesus delivering us from, from the powers. If you're a sort of traditional Protestant, you like, you, you like the idea of substitution. We have to have all these, uh, all, all these different understandings of the atonement that Paul brings together uh, in, in, my, in mind, and the church, the church needs all of them. Join me in thanking our panelists today. Thank you, my and friend. Join me in thanking David Cates for stepping in for me. My glad. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.